I think, entered or are entering a, uh, another period of, uh, uh, of economic flux. And I think I, I want to spend my first, whatever it is, five, ten minutes, um, providing a bit of a, a framework for uh, how it's best to view that. Because as Thomas has said, there's an awful lot going on from China to Brazil to oil prices to stock markets falling quite a lot to something we may discuss in more detail, the rather bizarre turn of central banks turning interest rates negative, you know, something which would, a few years ago would be seen as uh, a very uh, uh, improbabilistic thing. So there's lots and lots of things going on at the moment. Um, and uh, it's possible um, that we can get a little confused by it, or rephrase that. I get a bit confused when there's so many things going on uh, at time. So I think it's um, valuable, I think, I try to disentangle or separate out the sort of essential things that are going on from the more incidental ones and try to get underneath to the sort of core uh, economic developments. And in that spirit, the framework I'm going to offer is one which um, I find useful and if you're even a, a tiny bit unclear as to what's going on, maybe you find it, might find it of some use, um, which is to give a sort of simplistic view of the economy as being made up of two parts. This is very simplistic, and no doubt my fellow speaker will uh, add some uh, 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 caveats to it, but very simplistically, the economy has got two parts. It's got a productive part and a financial part. Uh, and the productive part is where things are made, services, goods, which what's important about it is that's where value is created. The financial part is much more to do with the uh, buying and selling, lending money, and generally it's to do with the circulation of existing values. So these two parts, one to do with the creation value and one to do with the broadly and very sort of short, shorthand language, uh, the, the circulation of what has already been produced. These two parts both have important roles to play, they're, they're not autonomous by any means, they're very much interrelated. Um, but what I'm going to suggest is that when you have a changing relationship between these two parts of the economy, then that's usually indicative of something deeper going on. Just a, a tiny illustration of the importance, or, or not as much the importance, but the value of that sort of finance versus production view of things. Um, a newspaper headline caught my eye just a couple of days ago, and it said this. It said, Investment in city office space is at an all-time high. Investment in city office space is, is at an all-time high. And I went on the first to say this is a record. It's at a record level. Now, the specifics of this story is not what I'm going to go into. But um, what are we supposed to draw from such a, a, a headline and such a view that we're at a record level of investment? Now, one could see this as a feel-good story against all the doom and gloom which uh, you know, Thomas was relaying and which we can read in all the other uh, business pages, that uh, here's something good, you know, investment, record high, doing very well. Um, but actually, if you look into the story, what it's really talking about is not a record of productive investment in building and constructing new properties and, and office blocks which could be put to productive use, but it's a record level of financial investment in existing offices in the, in the City of London. So it's investors and companies putting a record amounts of money into buying existing and therefore really just transferring existing assets within the city. Um, and so investment, just like I would say, you know, most other aspects of the economy has got this dual aspect to it. There's either a productive way of seeing it or a financial way. And both, I say, are, are, are quite legitimate. There's an important role for financial investors, important role for productive investors. Um, uh, but they represent different things. One is to do about the creation of value, I say, the other is to do with the circulation of value. And depending which is being referred to, and I say this sort of uh, 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 article was, uh, I'm not saying it was playing on that ambiguity of what investment is, but that ambiguity of it um, can blur what is going on. Because on the one level, if you've got a record level of, of productive investment going on, that probably is a good thing. On the other hand, uh, it can have very different connotations if the investment is simply uh, a, a large amount of existing assets uh, being uh, uh, exchanged in the hope that you're going to get a good return on rent and, and that sort of thing. They represent different things and possibly uh, uh, can be even opposite things. Now, of course, there's nothing new about this 
dual meaning of the word investment. And, uh, uh, but what I want to stress is I think there's been far too little recognition and far too little discussion of the consequences of the way Western economies, not recently but for many decades now, have become uh, reorientated to becoming much less dependent on productive activities and productive investment and much more dependent on financialized activities, including financial investment. But broadly, the shift, there's been a, 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 the balance has shifted. Um, and that's something which I think has got uh, much more uh, uh, profound consequences than uh, is generally recognized in the, in, the, uh, in the commentary on what is going on. But I think that provides, if we can see that uh, simplistic division of different things going on, production going on and finance going on, and look at the relationship to them, I think it does unfold some of the, uh, some of the things which are happening. As I've already said, this is not new in terms of this uh, 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 distinction between the two. Uh, I, I think we, can, we may agree, may disagree. I think it goes back to, the, to really the 1970s, you can see it, but particularly in the 1980s, where there has been a reorientation more to financialized activities from productive activities. But there's a potential problem here, not because the two things don't have uh, a purpose in a modern economy, but because if they get out of sync, if the financial side gets out of sync with the productive side, then that creates the potential for problems, for economic problems, and possibly that, I'll be suggesting, possibly something to do with that is to do with the, uh, uh, the, the turmoil that we're seeing today. Because ultimately, all those financial activities, those financial investments, such as the people buying you know, the office blocks in the, in the city of London, they are expecting a financial return. And ultimately, that financial return has to come out of value which is being created somewhere, I would, I, uh, I, I'm suggesting. And so if you don't have enough productive activity going on, if you don't have enough productive investment and uh, high quality production on the back of that, of producing goods and services efficiently, you're not gonna have enough value being created to be able to afford to consistently and uh, uh, on, a, on a persistent basis pay the return to those financial investors. There's a, mis a, a mismatch uh, uh, will take place if the two things are out of sync in too big a way. And that broadly is, I think, where we, not are today, but where we have been increasingly over the last, uh, over the last few, few decades. So that's the framework I'm suggesting. That there's too little production and too much of the, the financialized activities in place of that. And when this happens, what we also get, which I think we'll probably all be familiar with seeing, what we also get is a much greater reliance upon debt. Because if you've not got enough new values being created today, then a lot of the activity going on, financial and productive activity, which still exists, a lot of that is based not on the reinvestment of the new values which are being created, but a lot of it is based on debt. And that's why in this thing which I and others would call an increasingly financialized economy, it's also simultaneously a debt economy. And I, we may agree on this, I think. I think we can see the takeoff of debt beginning in, I mean, there was some of it in the late 1970s, there's a sort of recycling of petrodollars and all that was going on, but mainly it's from the middle of the 1980s where we've seen an increase in debt, initially in, uh, in private debt, in uh, uh, going into household debt, then corporate debt, and more recently, much more in, the, in terms of public debt. But there has been this steady increase in all forms of activity relying upon not in some way uh, using the foundation of the new values out of production, but are relying on borrowing and leveraging, as it's called, and uh, uh, greater indebtedness. Um, uh, uh, and that um, uh, uh, is, I think, an underpinning to the potential sources of instability which we're seeing on today. So moving on to today's, what I see as a return of flux in the economy, what we're seeing, I think, is the beginnings of some of the limitations of the way that financialized economy can help to make everything look as if it's uh, doing okay. Because in this uneven sort of dual world, very simplistic world of counterposing production to finance, in that, in that uh, 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 world, um, for long periods of time, the financialized part of the economy can prop up the rest of the economy and make things look pretty okay. Um, People may know that the period between the sort of late 80s, the early 90s, through to the 2008 crash, a lot of people, particularly America, describe this as the, uh, the great moderation. 
uh, that this was a period where things were stabilizing, where you had steady growth, and basically, you know, living was, was pretty good. You know, you'd had those earlier problems in the 70s, you'd had a lot of disruption going on in the early 1980s, but from the late 80s through, for about 15, 20 years, people were talking about it as a, as a, 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 as a great moderation. And that, I think, is, is, is testimony to the relative success of a debt economy, a financialized economy, to be able to keep things uh, looking, looking shipshape, but at the expense of building up debt all the time that was, uh, that was taking place. But that also means, I think, there was a sort of a return to that relative stability since about 2010 to 2011. You know, after the turmoil of, uh, that Thomas was describing, the 2008 crash for, and the recessions which ensued from that, it appeared that things were getting back to normal. Even if you look back in the newspapers, just before Christmas, you'll see a whole lot of people making their projections, economists and analysts and uh, financial practitioners and other, making their uh, uh, predictions for the next year. And they were generally pretty bullish, generally saying, you know, the British economy is, is strengthening, it's had 3% growth for the, the last sort of 18, 24 months, that's likely to continue. The American economy doing pretty well as well. You can see, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, employment figures, number of new jobs were on a, on a fairly, fairly consistent level. Uh, uh, even people were saying the Eurozone, you know, countries had sort of put the Greek debt crisis behind it, and you're beginning to see not. Two, three percent, but you know, half a percent or a percent, but better than it was. So the general view that the uh, economy was doing pretty well, and then of course, those predictions of a, of a benign future. Uh, once they get back to their desks on whatever it was, fourth of January, everything begins to everything begins to fall apart. But what I'm saying is that for a long time, that financialized economy really does create an, an appearance and a reality that things are, are doing okay. Uh, until, of course, uh, it, it stops. And what that represents, what that flux, which is kicking in, kicking in today, represents, is that that financialized support, or the support from the financialized activities and from debt growth and so on, um, can't cover for the shortage of new values forever. Um, uh, a, a number of limitations come to the fore. Um, I see them as sort of three classes of limitations of, of of uh, uh, the financialized economy. I, I summarize it as the, the limitation of perpetuation, whereby it doesn't solve any of the underlying problems, but it perpetuates them. The limitation of exhaustion, whereby these measures begin to become less and less effective as time goes on. And the third limitation uh, is instability, that they actually create, they don't just not cover up the other problems of instability, but they create their own independent sources of instability. And I think it's those limits coming to the fore uh, today which is what underpins uh, the, uh, the period of financial turmoil. Have I got time to illustrate that? With, or would no, you like to leave no, that there? Okay. okay. So I think that, uh, uh, I'll come back later in the discussion, I, can, I think if we illustrate that around what's happening in central banking at the moment, I think we can see those, those interconnected limitations of perpetuating the underlying problems, not solving anything at the level of production, of becoming less and less effective as time goes on, so they become more and more desperate in terms of uh, the sort of policies and the sort of measures that are needed, and the creation of this uh, potential for instability, whether it's new asset bubbles bursting, as have burst before, or whether it's a, a, a potential for banks getting into difficulties because of the consequences of what things are doing. Whatever form, I, I'm not going to predict, I don't think anybody can predict what particular form it is, but those undercurrent of instabilities arising from this palliative begin to, uh, uh, begin to take effect. And so in short, I think what we're seeing is that the favored palliatives of the past period uh, namely, easy money and mounting debt are beginning to turn nasty once again. Not for the first time, but they're beginning to turn nasty again. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I will tell my own story, and then we can uh, match up later on. I've written a book which is called, which is one word title hubris, and the subtitle is Why Economists Fail to Predict the Recession and How to Avoid the Next One. Um, I take the view that basically we have to talk about the global system, a capitalism of the global system. It has been for a long time. It deglobalizes and globalizes, but you know. 
So one of the one way to think about the recession, our current problem, is in a sort of long run perspective. That between 1945 and about 1975, roughly speaking, uh, the Western world had what was called the Keynesian Golden Age. Never before in the history of capitalism had there been such sustained economic growth with full employment, fairly low to moderate inflation until about halfway through. And for the first time, widespread prosperity. A number of countries built up their welfare state and uh, you know things like free higher education and uh, you know, sort of uh, good uh, uh, wages, real wages rising every year in uh, manufacturing, so manual workers. Uh, in America, people started talking about how one person, the male member of the family going out to work uh, was able to keep the wife and the children in good uh, thing, had a car in the door and a house. Uh, and uh, in in UK, I remember in the 1950s, sociologists were scandalized that the people living in council estates had a car. You know, was the proletariat getting bourgeoisified? There's actually a book on it. Uh, you know, this is how shocking that a person in council property can have a car. And why not? Anyway, we were just getting used to prosperity. And around about 1970, early 70s, this whole cycle uh, came to an end. Along the cycle, wages were rising very fast, faster than uh, labor productivity, profits were squeezing, and in general, income distribution was improving. Income inequality was getting less. So this is basically, I'm talking about Western world. At the same time, what was then called the underdeveloped world or the developing world, or the third world was uh, still struggling. They were relying on uh, foreign aid. They couldn't actually raise money on any market. And they were struggling exporting primary commodities, so on. And then there was the second world, which you have forgot. Second world had rejected capitalism. And first of all, the Soviet Union and China were the two original communist revolutions. And then there was uh, Eastern European uh, part, which also, and basically the state ownership of means of production, uh, more or less, not a lot of uh, public housing and so on. There was income inequality, but it was well hidden in terms of people with official status and more access to uh, good things than others. But, you know, and it was always thought at that time that the Soviet Union and that world would actually take over. That was the future. When I was brought up, uh, when I grew up in India, we all believed that was the future. You know, uh, the, the Russians threw Sputnik. Nobody remembers Sputnik. But when Sputnik went up, uh, the Americans were completely shocked. That there, there was a Soviet a dog called Laika in the Sputnik. And uh, Samuelson, who was one of the great economists of our times, said in the 1960s that eventually Russia would surpass United States in productivity. Uh, I was in a, a student in America, and there used to be a thing on a bus with Khrushchev saying, we shall bury you uh, in, in, a, in a mountain of commodities. Uh, now, in the early 70s, there was a very big break in the system. And the big break comes, uh, first of all, because uh, uh, the, the system was built uh, the post-war system was built on a kind of monetary arrangement in which the dollar was built based on gold. Until, until the Second World War, there was something called gold standard. I won't go into it, but there was uh, currency stability. Uh, you could not actually print your own money because your money had to relate to the amount of gold you had. And countries did not have monetary sovereignty. Countries couldn't just publish, uh, print their own money. There was all sorts of system. And uh, in, in 1945, to manage the transition, gold standard had broken down. They said the dollar will, dollar will, be, uh, will, will guarantee, the Americans will guarantee that at $35 to an ounce, they will sell gold officially 
between countries to settle any balance of payments differences. So if somebody had a surplus, a surplus claim against America, they didn't want to hedge just their dollar credits, they could get gold. It was sort of innocent. And America had full employment, it had begin to have inflation, then it was fighting the Vietnam War, and Lyndon Johnson tried to build a great society, which is kind of welfare state by American standards, much less than America. But anyway, America went into a huge balance of payments uh, deficit and finally decided that they were not going to uh, guarantee to sell gold at $35 an ounce. They went off the gold standard. At that stage, a whole new thing appeared for the first time in, uh, in uh, at least modern economic history that countries began free to print their own money. You know, before that, there used to be all sorts of beliefs that uh, there was unemployment because the bankers would not print enough money, somebody would restrict. No, each, each government could print money. And of course, inflation exploded because two years after that uh, episode, August the 15th, 1971, when America went out the gold standard, uh, the oil price quadrupled from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel, uh, or $12 or whatever it was. Yes, whatever it is right now, at uh, $30 and it used to be $100. Now, the inflation that this caused for the developed economies, because they had all become very energy intensive in their production. Oil had not changed in price for 40 years. Very energy intensive, plus full employment, costs were very high. And the big crisis of Western world starts then because a lot of manufacturing just stopped being profitable for the Western countries. And just at that time, uh, the developing world, especially in Asia, had come to the sort of maturity where they could take over the production of simple manufactured goods. So more, and of course, by that time we had uh, ComSat, communication satellite, we had uh, container ships, uh, and we had sort of a very primitive form of uh, computerized uh, management, you know, uh, CAD CAM, computer aided uh, design, computer aided management. So you could transfer production to, uh, say, Korea. You could have all the decisions made here, and then actual manufacturing done there. And the production process was simple enough, so it didn't need high skill for uh, people to start doing it. And so the Western economies were hollowed out. They were hollowed out because uh, they could not actually compete uh, in terms of selling manufacturers. And people who used to have good jobs, especially skilled manual, uh, skilled or semi-skilled manual workers, mainly men, suddenly no longer had good jobs. Some of them went, at least in Europe, because the welfare state was good, they went on long-term unemployment. Or they went into service sector jobs. In America, there, is no, there was no welfare state, so a lot of them went into service sector jobs. And service sector jobs were typically less well-paid, uh, and they were more insecure. And very often you found that uh, both members of the family had to go out to work to make, to make as much as you used to do with one job. And, you know, uh, so the whole, so Western economies had high-tech manufacturing, which took highly skilled labor, aerospace, pharmaceuticals, things like that. And of course, there are a lot of, now this transformation made between sort of mid-70s to about late 80s. There was, you know, it was called stagflation, it was called, you know, long recession, whatever it was. But the good old Keynesian list disappeared. And we were fighting inflation. Monetarism was important. We had to fight inflation. We had to control money supply. We had to cut public expenditure, Thatcherism, Reaganism, whatever else it was. And we've, we all kind of lived through this. I mean, we've lived through all this. I'm not talking anything new. And uh, sort of the idea among economists was the kind of thing we believed in the 50s and 60s, that public spending was a good thing. If you're unemployment, just spend more money, increase government debt, and it'll all get paid back. 
that uh, that all those things got uh, you know disagreed upon because you know inflation matters more than that. And as uh, Phil was saying, the great moderation was that among economists, that was a grand truce. They finally stopped quarreling with each other and decided that uh, money supply had to be controlled by the central bank. You see, because once you went to the gold standard, no country knew how much money to, money to print. What was the rule? What was the monetary rule? Well, the rule was you keep inflation under control. How do you do that? You make central bank independent. Central banks can be trusted. Governments can't be trusted. Governments will always print money, given half a chance, because politicians want to be popular. Bankers don't have to be popular, central bankers especially. So that was, that was so, uh, so central bank had to control money supply, keep inflation low, and governments had to balance their budget more or less, if not year by year, on the long run, and keep the debt, debt income ratio under control. The whole European, uh, the whole Eurozone system has been built on the idea that governments can't have more than 2% deficit uh, at any time, it must balance. The debt GDP ratio mustn't go above a certain value, 40%. And, you know, government, uh, in, within the Eurozone, no government has control over its money supply or its exchange rate, and its budget is supposed to be restricted. And we all thought this was a way to. And, for, and again, as Philip said, between 1990 and 2008, we had a continuous and unprecedented uh, boom. Two good things about the boom was, first of all, the second world disappeared. Communism as an alternative completely disappeared. I never ever thought I would live to see the day when there was no Soviet Union. No, it wasn't there. And the whole idea of a communist economic system disappeared. And suddenly, about 30, 40 countries were added to uh, where the stock markets could be. The financial markets are a bonanza because certainly countries who, who were not, had, didn't have any bonds to sell, they were able to borrow, they were better on the London market, because by then we already had the computer, uh, the, uh, computer revolution. And you could make and trade around the world on your computer and on your screen. So there was a big technical revolution in the, in the Western world, the Silicon Valley Revolution. So suddenly the financial market, you quite right, financial market became very important because financial markets were global. And everybody wanted to float bonds on the London Stock Exchange or New York Stock Exchange, bonds and stocks and things like that. And then people found new things to trade, which I won't uh, bore you with. And so financial markets as a whole became much bigger in global contests than before. Uh, and another thing which happened at that time was that the so-called third world was also a participant in the growth process, which it had not been before. Asia, especially Asia and some bits of Latin America, because Asian had good literacy, uh, cheap labor, cheap disciplined labor, they could absorb a lot of investment and they could export. So, Basically, manufacturers that we use are more or less not produced in the Western world anymore. They're all produced in Asia or Latin America. Uh, I, I, I was a part of the thing, and there was a meeting in, I think, Lima, uh, Santiago or Lima, I forget, in 1970, where they said that the third world should have at least 25% share of manufacturing exports by 2000, and now it will be laughed at because now it will be very good if the developed countries had a share of 25% in manufacturing exports because basically manufacturing exports are done by third world, so-called third world. And so the, the globalization was a specialization. Uh, the first world has high tech uh, manufacturing, the third world has, oh, there's no second world. So the rest of them have uh, uh, low tech manufacturing. Now, this, this particular, and again, uh, it's quite right that at least two things happened in the second boom that income inequality grew enormously. Because, at least for the, in the developed world, the, basically the working classes, now everybody's called middle class. So the middle classes, 
were not having as good an income as they used to have before. In, in, in America, the average compensation, as it is called, workers, has not increased for 40 years in real terms. And it's quite, quite unusual. Uh, and uh, so they began to borrow. And borrowing became much cheaper, much easier, much cheaper. The financial revolution meant you would find your credit cards and debit cards and this and that, and, and you, could, you could service your debt and so on. Uh, in America, there was a big, big move by the government to extend mortgage credit to people who would not normally have uh, got, uh, got bank loans, part of the progressive legislation Clinton had. Uh, in, and so what is called subprime mortgages, mortgages given to people who had no guaranteed income to be able to repay. And all across the Western world, the idea came that buying houses was the best investment possible because houses only went up in price, never went down. And people bought, had a mortgage and bought a house because they thought, if I can't pay it now, I'll sell the house and pay my, my debt. So anyway, this, and this, this particular scheme of, uh, from 1990 to about 2008, uh, very much, uh, much more, say, uh, what's called the emerging nations, uh, the, th the so-called former third world countries becoming prosperous, India, China, Brazil, Russia, the BRICS countries, uh, became part of the global uh, uh, super economies where people invested and so on. Now, this whole particular thing, actually the weakness was in... Uh, uh, the Western countries, uh, partly because, again, uh, what I shared with Phil, is that, uh, well, three things that are happening which, which, uh, which let, let me know. One is we have a 50-year cycle. Uh, a 50-year cycle is basically triggered off by sort of inventions or innovations. There's a man called Joseph Schumpeter a great Austrian economist who talked about innovations. So you certainly have a bunch of innovations. In the, in the 1780s, the cotton spinning, the steam revolution set off the industrial revolution with lots of things, use of steam in cotton textiles, I think. That got exhausted and kind of came back. Around 1840s, 1850s, you had the railways and, and that sort of revolution. Then another 50 years later, you have the electricity and the chemical revolution, the automobile, and so on. And so kind of every 50 years. Uh, so you have a 50-year cycle of production. It goes up, then it goes down. In between, you have uh, this sort of cycle that uh, Marx talked about, in which uh, a boom starts, employment increases, Wages go up faster than, than productivity, profit shrink, and you have a wage profit cycle. And lastly, you have this very peculiar thing which we have all the time, is that if interest rates are too low, people borrow a lot because they can make money by reinvesting the borrowing. That cycle always overruns itself, and eventually people borrow too much, and asset prices fall, they go bankrupt, and. So these three things, you know, weave into each other, and in uh, in the most recent cycle, what had happened? That we hadn't had, we haven't had the next technological revolution yet. We had a Silicon Valley in the 70s <coughs> and early 80s. We haven't had a big revolution since. Uh, so that that thing was being exhausted. Uh, the wage profit cycle was actually very f much in favor of profits in, uh, in the Western world and less so in the, in the rest of the world. But that, the, the wages being low led to indebtedness of households. And then the people, uh, because uh, 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 inflation was very low, Inflation was low, actually not because the bankers were very clever, but because the Asians were selling manufacturers to the Western world at cheap prices. Inflation used to be part of our lives because manufacturing goods used to be very expensive. Suddenly, 400 million more workers came onto the scene doing manufacturing, and, and, and with low wages, manufacturing prices collapsed. And 
All those things mean inflation is low and people don't think globally. So each, each country in the developed world thought it's our clever financial regulations, our clever central bankers who are delivering us low inflation, good growth, despite low interest rates and let interest rates remain low. And so anyway, that led to the subprime mortgage boom. People made foolish investments and the whole thing crashed in 2008. Now, my view is that if that was a boom period between 1990 and 2008, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of running this idea that there are 50 year cycles. Uh, and we have in the downward phase of a 25 year old cycle, 25 year old cycle. And we are only one third of the way through it. So there is another 10 years of very low output, very low inflation left yet to go. And actually what's interesting is that there is a discussion of this now. You know, some old ideas are coming back. If any of you know a magazine called Foreign Affairs, uh, there is an article in it by a man called Larry Summers, who is a prominent economist in America. An idea is called secular stagnation. Secular stagnation is an idea which I studied as, a, uh, as an undergraduate in Bombay in the 1950s, uh, which was very popular in the 1950s. The idea was that ultimately in capitalism, there is too much savings and not enough investment. It's too much savings because the rich save too much. Uh, and, and as, as, as income inequality grows, the rich save too much, and there are not enough investment opportunities to take over uh, that savings, and therefore, you know, uh, that is depression in the economy. And a lot of people are beginning to think that somehow, at least in the Western world, the momentum of growth has gone. There is no, as I said, there's no new technological progress going on. Productivity growth is slowing down. And uh, there is excess of savings, inequality is very grown. And although interest rates are very low, practically zero, there is no private, there is no productive investment taking place. A lot of buying and selling of existing stocks and shares. Now, the bad news is that uh, this may, we may be in, we may not be out of this for, from 20, 2008. We may have to wait, you know, my guess is good anyway. We may be here till late 2020s, or we may not be. Uh, the only thing is if we suddenly have a bunch of innovations, and things are, you know, things are sort of in the prospect, like driverless cars, electric cars, and lots and lots of uh, productive investments, productive uh, inventions which are kind of clustering together robotics, artificial intelligence, which everybody says may transform the economy. And then we'll have to create new jobs for this, you know, and things like that. But that has not happened yet. When that happens, maybe we will have the next big boom. In the meantime, here we are. Uh, and actually, you know, the thing is, that although we may feel very depressed, over the last 50 years, inequality, if you think of nations as individuals, inequality between nations has reduced. There are countries which are seriously in the news, uh, not as rich as we are, but at least if they go bad, we suffer. Uh, you know, all of Asia was, and no, nobody would ever have thought that Korea having an economic problem would matter. But Scotland had a, had a factory shut down because of a Korean company going bust. Things like that would never have happened in the 1950s. So between, uh, within nations, income inequality has grown, but between nations, income inequality has reduced. So we have many more moderately prosperous nations than we used to have. Africa's turn is yet to come, but uh, <coughs> at least we're talking about China and India. Just, you know, in the 1960s, Kissinger said, if only India and China could feed themselves, there'd be no problems in the world. Nobody would talk about India and China like that anymore. Uh, you know, as again, as Phil said, India is today the fastest growing economy 
in the world at seven and a half percent. I think our situation is going to remain like that. But you know, we are at a high level of income. You know, we are not actually badly, we are, we are not growing, but we are not decelerating either. And yes, there is an intergenerational thing that a younger generation is not going to have as good a time as, 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 as elder people did. But, you know, we are not by any means uh, badly off. Sorry. Uh, okay, I can stop talking. Hello? <laughs> David. No, he's gone. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. <laughs>